Tough times don't last forever. There is no doubt that we are all tired of the sorrows, pains, and deadness pervading the land. I have good news for you. Christ has come to guarantee true change this April at the Deeper Life National Easter Retreat. It's your time to experience Christ's resurrection power. From Thursday 6th to Monday 10th, April 2023, Join the nearest Deeper Life Retreat location around the globe. Christ's power will be unveiled by Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumui and other anointed men of God. Everyone is welcome. The retreat time is a time of waiting before the Lord. I want to plead with you. Be present in every session. The Lord will fill your cup to overflowing. Come um, and taste of Christ's resurrection power. It's real. Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the Let world. Our Father, we're asking that you'll be with us at this study now. I will pray that you'll explain and apply all these words we're hearing and reading to every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We grant, we pray that you'll grant us understanding, give us wisdom, so we can apply all these things ourselves to our daily living so we can be more victorious than we have ever been in jesus name thank you lord for the answer we pray in jesus name we're reading and studying from proverbs chapter 6 we're considering the whole chapter and the chapter is giving us instructions, commandments, and warnings for God's children. Here Solomon wrote, but writing on behalf of God, not his own word, but the word of God, the Creator Father, over all the sons of men. But then in particular, to the people that are called sons to God, through a covenant relationship. You would have discovered in all that we have been studying that many times that the writer writes to the sons. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Chapter 2, verse 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. In chapter 3, verse 1, My son, forget not the law, my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. And in chapter 4, verse 10, Hear, O my son, receive my sayings and the years of thy life shall be many. Verse 20, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Chapter 5, verse 1, my son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. Chapter 6, verse 1, 
my son, if thou be shorty for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. Verse 20, my son, keep thy father's commandment. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Chapter 7, verse 1, my son, keep my words, lay up my commandments with thee. And so you will see that Solomon, on behalf of the Heavenly Father, speak, speaks to the sons. Now we need to understand, if this is the word of God, and here the Father speaks to the children, we need to understand how we become children of God. For those who do not know already how to become a son of God, a daughter of God, the word of God makes it very clear and plain. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 14, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God, the great creator God in heaven, the Lord Almighty, the one that loves so much and the one that has all power. He says, if people are going to become his sons and daughters, they must distinguish themselves. They must separate themselves from the generality of sinners in the world. Be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. The things that make you unclean, unclean in thought, unclean in life, unclean in behavior, unclean in your morals, what we normally call sin or trespass, or evil, or iniquity, come out of them. And then also come out from the gang of evil doers. And then will I receive you. Then will you be my son, when you, then will you be my daughter. In John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. After you have repented of your sins, turning your back on everything that is evil, not just the majority of what you know to be wrong, not just changing little by little gradually, but you make up your mind in a once-for-all decision that you are going to forsake everything evil. Then you come to the Lord, and you remember that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. You receive him. You believe him. Then by faith, you receive the forgiveness that God as provided through Christ, you become a child of God. For those of us who have become children of God by repentance and faith in Christ, how do we keep that experience? How do we remain children of God? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. When you have become a child of God, the witness is not coming from the world. The confirmation of you being a child of God is not coming from the people of the world. For the world knoweth us not, neither did the world know him, Christ our Savior. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. We know that because of the inner witness of the Spirit. We know that because of the change that God has wrought in our lives. We know that because of the grace that we have received. We know that because of the peace that we enjoy. We know that because of the confidence and assurance that our names are written in heaven. Be beloved, now are we the sons of God. Some people think it's only when we get to heaven, we'll know that we're children of God. But now, are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And every man in every church that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. That is, if you have this assurance and confidence that you are a child of God, here is something you need to take care of. You need to purify yourself. Live a holy life, a righteous life. Because the hope you have of seeing him face to face will only mature, will only be materialized if you remain as a child of God in righteousness and holiness. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 
from verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. In the passage we are studying, God directs his word to his own children, and it's written in a personal way. And when you read all that we're reading here, if you can imagine, think of the voice of God coming to you out of the clouds and saying over and over. And he teaches a series or a set of precepts, patterns, and principles. After that, he says again, my son, to call your attention back to what he has been saying. In chapter 1, he called your attention, my son. In chapter 2, again, before he begins, the series of commandments and warnings, he calls your attention again, my son. In chapter 3, again, as if he's warning you, don't sleep off, don't doze off, don't daydream, don't let your mind wander, my son. Then in chapter 4, again, just to catch your attention, he repeats again, my son, are you hearing? Are you assimilating? Are you applying all these things to your lives? Then in chapter 5, again, he calls your attention, to jolt you, to wake you up, to make you arouse from slumber, my son. Then in chapter 6, again, he begins the chapter by saying, my son, because he wants to begin to give you some important lessons, rich principles, that if you take these things to heart, you will not go through life in ignorance, making many, many mistakes. You see what we are today. Many lives have been mad and broken and destroyed because of many mistakes we have made in the past. We didn't hear the voice of the Father. And we didn't hear the voice of a godly father, godly mother, telling us the word of, Lord, of the Lord Almighty. Telling us, this is the way to go. This is the way to move. And in what area do we make the greatest mistakes in our lives? I'll tell you. In giving quick, thoughtless promises that we regret later. And if I can give you a chance to raise up your hand, those who have given promises in the past that later you just regretted, those who made pledges, those who signed contracts, those who did some things and gave their hands to a particular thing that later when they thought about it, they saw that that promise I gave, that pledge I gave, that thing I gave my hand into, that was foolish. That's a great mistake. I shouldn't have done that. That's why the Lord is calling us now, telling us, my son, chapter 6, verse 1. This is the instruction from the Father. Chapter 6, verse 1. My son, if thou be shorty for thy friend, if thou art stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. You know what that is saying? If you are shorty for an unknown, an untried, an unproved, an undependable friend, a casual person you just met. And then you said, I'm backing you up. I'm supporting you. I give my word to you. I hand over everything I have to you. You are shorty for him. You say, I'm a foundation upon which you can build. I will, I will defend your word. I will defend anything you say, anywhere. But you don't know this man very well. He's undependable. He has not been tried. He has not been proven. And you have not known that this is a real trustworthy person. And you gave your hand. And he got into trouble and you bailed him out. And you told the policemen and you told all the people that were looking for him, he is my friend, anything you want, ask me. I will stand for him. He says, when you do that, you are snared with the words of your mouth. You are taken in a net. You know, when it says, if thou art stricken hand with a stranger, what does that mean? You know, sometimes in our own language, colloquial language, we say, I gave my hand in marriage. What does that mean? I gave my promise in marriage. I gave a pledge that I will marry that person. I gave my hand. So when you strike hand with a stranger, what does that mean? It means you say, I'm standing as surety for him. I am standing as backbone for him. I pledge and I give all that I have to support that 
I affirm that what this man is saying is the truth. If you find anything wrong with it, come and hold me responsible. And the Bible says when you do that to a stranger, when you do that to an untried, unproved, undependable, somebody that is not trustworthy, an undependable friend, acquaintance, you've made a serious, serious mistake. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 11 and in verse 15. Proverbs 11, 15. He that is shorty for a stranger shall smart for it. And he shall, he that hateth shorty sheep is sure. What does that mean? He that is shorty for a stranger. You have just met somebody where you are living. Maybe you just packed to that environment. And that person came to you and said, you are new here? You said yes. He said, what's your name? Where did you come from? How old are you? Where are you working? Where do you bank? Where do you do this? And you give him all the details of your life. And he says, I'm a neighbor. I live down there. I'm a friend. And um, I, I see you're a Christian. I say, yes, I'm a Christian. Oh, I, I, I always love such people. Which church do you go, by the way? Then you mention the name of the church. I, I think I've had much about that church. And it just makes me to love you. From now on, I'm your friend. You are my friend. And you say, yes, I agree. We are friends. And you don't know that this man is a, a man of the night. It's a man that operates in the night. And then he went for his operation in the night, and they caught him and they put him in the cell. And then the police people said, if anybody can bail you out, well, we'll give you a chance. They'll bail you out. And then he gave them your address, and he sent for you. And as you saw him behind the bar, he said, my friend, look at where I am. Some people have just uh, told some lines on me, and they put me here. Now, my friend, can you be shorty for me? Can you bail me out? Can you stand for me? And I said, yes, I will do that, my friend. This person you are calling your friend is untried, unproved, undependable. It's not trustworthy. You don't really know him. You bail him out. And then three days after, he packed out of that place. You can't find him anymore. You get into trouble. Look at that verse. He that is shorty for a stranger shall smart for it, shall suffer for it. You know what the, you know the word smart? When you have a saw in your leg and you sprinkle salt on it, you smart for that salt. It pains you. And that means that now you have been foolish. You've given your hand. You've given a promise. You've given your pledge. And what you have given your pledge for is something you didn't really check up properly. And in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 18, A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh shorty in the presence of his friend. Void of understanding. He's always making a promise before he thinks of the consequence of the promise. He's always saying, yes, I will stand for you before he finds out the character of the person he's standing for. It's always signing a contract before he finds that the partners are dubious. It's always saying, well, I will marry you before he discovers that the person he says he wants to marry had married before. It's always saying, oh yes, I will follow you without knowing the destination. That man is shorty for a stranger. He'll suffer for it. You know what the Lord is teaching us? He's teaching us that we shouldn't back up anybody that is untried, unproved, not trustworthy. Make sure that before you will give your word, before you will give a pledge, before you will give a promise, you know the people you are supporting. In Proverbs chapter 22, verses 26 and 27, Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are shorties for debt. A neighbor uh, came to you and said, The landlord is um, uh, trying to eject me. And uh, I'm promising the landlord that in three weeks' time, I'll pay him. How much do you owe him? I owe him 5,000 5, naira. And you'll pay in three weeks, oh yes. And he wants me to bring somebody that can stand shorty for my debt. That he just somebody to say that he knows me. Just somebody that will say that I'm, I'm all right, I will pay him. He wants the word of another person so that his mind will be at rest. And I have a particular uh, contract somewhere that, um, that I'm, I'm believing it will come through in about two weeks' time. Three weeks' time, I'll pay him. And you don't know this man uh, totally and thoroughly. He's a sinner. He's not a believer. 
just a neighbor, just living around you here. And he said, can you follow me to the landlord? Then you followed him to the landlord. And then you begged the landlord. And the landlord said, no, it's not just begging. I want somebody that can stand shorty for him. Somebody that will say, if he disappoints, hold me. You can, carry my, you can come and carry my property. That's what I want. And your, your new friend, your untried friend, your un, unworthy friend, he told you, he said, my friend, if you really want to help me, stand for me. Because three weeks' time, I'm telling you that, in fact, before three weeks, I'll get everything settled. And then you, you told the landlord, you say, now here is my address where I live. Here is also where I work. Here is where I lead us fellowship. Here is where I do this. You give him all the details that you, that you have. And you say, if, um, if he disappoints you, come to me. He's my friend. And then after about two, three days, this man that you call your friend, quietly in the night, he packed out and then nobody, know where he, nobody knew where he went. And the landlord now came to you and said, well, your friend has gone. What shall we do now? Then you look for him, you can't get him. He got your address, you didn't get his address. He knew every detail about you, you didn't know anything about him. And already you have given your hand. Already you have stood a shorty for his debt. And the landlord said, well, you promised that I can take anything in your house. What's the amount that man owed me? And he came to your place of work to make trouble. He came to your own house to make trouble. And you said, well, I'm not the one owing you, oh yes, but you stood shorty for the one owing me. Look at verse 26 again. Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are shorties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? That if you are not careful, that man will take your bed and take your important property from your home. Then you will suffer because of your own foolishness. But that word of God is telling us to be very careful in a relationship with casual friends. People that are not trustworthy. Untried, unproven people. It's not talking about believers. Concerning believers, we're told that we must love one another, care for one another. You know that person, a real believer, a real child of God, care for him, love him, and lavish your love upon him. But we're talking about the people that you do not really know. Be sure that you do not give your hand. And now, the people that are planning marriage. You just meet somebody and he says, uh, Now, my sister, they know we call one another as brothers and sisters here. So she, he will use the language of the believer. How are you? Have you got married? No. Do you know I'm a believer too? I love the Lord so much. And you can't tell how much I love the Lord. Can you give me your hand in marriage? Without checking up, without praying, without doing anything. You say, are you sure you're a brother? Oh yes, I'm a brother. My name is in heaven. My name is in the church. My name is in the office. My name is everywhere. I'm surely a brother. You give your hand. And two days later, you discovered that is a quack, a fake person, a hypocrite. He's not a Christian at all. What do you do? Come back to Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 3, do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself, make sure thy friend, give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a robe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. If you have made a mistake by ignorantly, thoughtlessly, promising, signing a contract, giving your hand, giving a pledge, and you later discovered it was a great, great mistake. And that this sin is going to take your bed from under you. It's going to take your property off you. And it's going to totally make you a ridiculous person that everybody will say, look at this man, how can a man be foolish like this? To bail somebody out that was a robber. To bail somebody out that was dealing with cocaine. And to give a sand, a pledge, and to even go with the man to the court to swear Abida with for a case he knew nothing about. He says, if you can deliver yourself immediately with the grace of God, do not give a sleep to your eyelids. Make sure that you come out of that net, out of that snare, like an animal will get out of the net at the uh, possible opportunity. 
at the opportunity that is quickest and soonest. And so we have learned that we must not be foolish in giving promises to people. Now let's look at the industry of the faithful from verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her fruit in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, yet a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and I want as an armed man. What's the difference between the students that go to school and the students that are studying at home? Major difference. They may be using the same textbooks. They may be having the same type of brain, the same type of intelligence. They may have the same type of educational background, but one major difference. There is a timetable for the student at school. And even though the student at school might be a little bit lazy, Yet, the bell rings and calls him to class. He wakes up at the right time, especially those in the boarding houses. And they do the right thing at the right time, at least most of the time. You know the student at home? The student that is doing the study on his own? Oh, he will say, there is still time before the exam. I don't know why I'm not able to stay by my timetable. I don't know, I'm too, I'm too uh, tired this morning. I cannot wake up this morning. Well, I will soon wake up a little sleep. I will soon start to study now, a little folding of the hands. I will soon start now so that I, today I'm going to study seriously, but a little slumber. And that person, days will go, weeks will go, months will go. Eventually, failure will come as one that traveled. And failure will come as an armed man will grab that student. He'll never pass any exam. What's the difference between those who are working in the government and those who are self-employed? The people working with the government, they know that at a particular time, they ought to be in the office. And they ought to get this settled and that settled and that one settled. How about the man at home? Well, he says, I'll do that job. I don't know. I have a little headache this morning. Thank God I'm not working in an office where I have to go and get sick leave before they will excuse me. I can excuse myself. You know, yesterday, I sat down for a long time, and today now, how can I go and sit down again? I will sleep a little more. You see, last week, I did a lot of work so that I can meet the deadline and then give that project into the hands of the people that gave me. But this week now, I think I can rest a little. And then, just a little sleep, just a little slumber, just a little folding of the hands, poverty will come on that man. What's the difference between somebody that is employed outside as a salesman and the person that is working for himself, trading for himself? The salesman that is working for somebody knows that I am a sell. I must never give up because if I give up, I'm not going to have good commission. But the one that is working on his own, once he says, would you want to buy this? Oh no, I'm sorry, I don't want to buy that. He gives up. You don't worry about that because well, if you like, buy it. If you don't like to buy it, that's all, that's all right for you. I'm not going to force anybody. The one that is working on commission is going about and is making sure that he puts forth every effort, every argument, everything that he can do so that he can close the sale. But the one that is working on his own is like a sluggard, idle, indolent. And so we're learning that whatever we're doing, we must not be lazy. We must not be innocent. And it says, go to the ant, big man. Go to the small ants and learn the ways of the ants and be wise. Child, go to the ants. Thou sluggard, that always will procrastinate. I will do it tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, I will do it tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, I'll do it tomorrow. Go to the ants and learn the way of wisdom. They have no guide. They have no headmaster. They have no school instructor, they have no director, they have no manager. And yet, it says, they provide their meat in the summer and they gather their food in the harvest. How long? Will thou continue procrastinating, delaying, and sleeping, and not working? Laziness will ruin you. Laziness will destroy you. 
Laziness will bring poverty. When will thou arise out of thy sleep? And so here, the children of God are being taught, we must not be lazy. Those of us who are working in the church, as full-time workers, oh, somebody will say, that's just church work. Yes, but that's where you receive your salary. That's, where, that's why you earn your living. You must be up and doing. You mustn't say, well, it's church work, it's God's work, I can procrastinate. No, but you know, God is watching. God will see. If you are lazy and indolent. But it says, let's be up and doing. In chapter 10 of Proverbs, verses 4 and 5. He becometh poor that dealeth with his slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in the harvest is a son that causeth shame. In the work you are doing, put all your strength into it, wherever it is. Whether you are self-employed or you are a civil servant, put your strength, put your energy into it and give all the quality job you have to give for the time you are serving there. So that in good conscience, you will be able to say, I'm receiving pay for what I am doing. Then in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4, the soul of the sluggard desireth and asks nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made part. The people that are lazy, when time of promotion comes, they wonder why they are not promoted. But the people who are diligent and hardworking, and everybody will say, well, give the work to Mr. So-and-so. He's never tired. He's always doing the work. Do you know that the more you do, the more experience you have? The more you do, the more that work becomes easier for you. The more you do, the more you are able to take on even more job. The more you do, the more your brain is at a large. The more you do, the more your fingers and your body, the more they are used to working. But the people that are lazy, the less they do, the less they will, able, they will be able to do. Because the hands are not exercised, the brain is not exercised, the mind is not exercised. Therefore, it's to your advantage that you do more. Do more at every time of opportunity. Chapter 19, verse 15. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. An idle soul shall suffer hunger. The one that is always going about talking in the offices. Never work, but just talking and making people laugh in the office. And there is a lot of job piling up on his desk, on his table, but he will not touch it with a single finger. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23, In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the leaves tendeth only to penury, to poverty, and to lack. So we're encouraged, we must work. Let's come back to Proverbs chapter 6, from verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Which having no guide, or overseer, or ruler, provideth a meat in the summer, and gathereth a food in the harvest. I want you to focus on the word harvest. The ants give us a lesson, a great lesson. A lesson of industry at the time of harvest. A lesson of foresight at the time of harvest. A lesson of working in cooperation and unity at the time of harvest. A, a lesson of orderliness at the time of harvest. Now do you know that for us who are children of God, there is a spiritual dimension to harvesting. Look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. From verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Remember, we're reading about the harvest. The ant, they have their harvests. The farmers, they have their harvests. And also, the children of God, they have a type of harvest that the ants know nothing about, that the farmers know nothing about. Harvesting souls into the kingdom of God. Harvesting fruit into the kingdom of God. And Jesus here makes the believers to understand Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, 
for they are white already to harvest. All around you, there is a great harvest ripening. All around you, there are sinners waiting for the preaching of the gospel. All around you, there are people waiting so that somebody can call them and draw them and win them into the kingdom of God. And it says, the fields are white already. Many people that are fed up in the kingdom of the devil, in the kingdom of darkness, they are just waiting for somebody to come and harvest them into the kingdom of God and talk to them and preach to them and witness to them. Harvest them into the kingdom. In verse 36, And he that trippeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Look at Matthew chapter 9. And see what Jesus said again concerning harvesting. Verse 36, But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Now in the harvesting into the kingdom of God, we have a lot to learn. What do we learn? Number one, we must be industrious in witnessing. We must not be lazy. A little sleep, a little folding of the hand, a little slumber will make many people to die and to go to hell that you should have recovered, that you should have rescued, that you should have saved, that you should have brought into the kingdom of God. Therefore, be up and doing at every opportunity. Do not allow the harvest to be wasted. Not only that, we must have foresight. Because we are told about those ants that they had foresight. They know that the harvest will soon be over. Therefore, they are very diligent at the time of the harvest. And the children of God must look ahead. Have foresight. The Lord will soon come. Have foresight. How much do you want your reward to be when Jesus comes? Have foresight. The people that are not harvested today may not be ready for harvesting tomorrow. Have foresight. If you do not get to them in time and harvest them into the kingdom of God, they may become worse in sin, hardened in sin. Not only that, there should be unity and cooperation in the harvesting. You see, as the ants are working, they do not disturb one another. If you have watched the hands carrying their load, there's so much unity. That is, if, they, if one ant is not able to carry that load alone, he will secure the help of other little, little hands and they surround that little thing and they carry it all together. They pull in the same direction. What do we learn from that? We're learning that we must evangelize in a cooperative manner, not competitive, destructive manner. Cooperate with one another. Two people going out to evangelize to our best. Cooperate together. All the people in a particular area, cooperate together. Let there be unity. Let there be orderliness. Orderliness. While you are talking to one soul and you are harvesting already, why should another person bring confusion and then try to talk a, a contrary thing to the person you are talking to already? We're learning that in our harvesting of souls. We learn from the ants. Industry, foresight, unity, cooperation and orderliness but there's a lot we can still learn from the harvesting of the old testament days in ruth chapter 2 ruth chapter 2 verse 21 and ruth the moabites said he said unto me also thou shalt keep fast thou shalt keep close to my young men until they have ended all my harvest ruth had just come into the land of israel and Boaz told her, you came at the time of harvesting. Don't be lazy. Keep close. Keep fast to the young men until the end of the harvest. You have just come. You have just become a child of God. Don't say that harvesting of souls is only for the people that have been long, long there in the kingdom of God. Yes, join them. Learn the techniques of going out and witnessing. Even though you have just come as Ruth coming from Moab, and you have not joined with the people of God until the time of harvest, start walking, start witnessing, start telling others about the love of God that has drawn you that by the side of the young men. All the young men should be involved in the harvesting. In verse 23, so she kept passed by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and unto the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. 
the maidens also, they were involved. Do you know that harvesting is for both brothers and sisters? Do you know that sisters cannot say, well, let the brothers go and evangelize? Ruth wasn't a man, just a woman. And she kept busy. Every day she went to the harvest. And the harvesting of the soul that is going on. You sister, you cannot fold your hand. You cannot sleep and slumber and be, and be indolent. Be passed by the young men and by the maidens. And do your part in the work. In Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. Verse 20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. Hear the cry of the unsaved. Hear, see the tears of the unconverted. They said, the harvest is past. The harvest is past. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. One day is coming. When night will come. This is the day. Walk while it is day. The night cometh. When no man can walk. The night cometh when people will say the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and yet there are many people not saved. Why are they not saved? Look at chapter 5, verse 23 and verse 24. But these people have a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. You know why many people remain unsaved? While the harvest is ending? Because the people of God, they are rebellious at heart. They do not have compassion in their heart. They are hard at heart. Neither do they say, every day they wake up, this is the appointed week of the harvest. And the harvest time will soon be over. So let's get out and harvest. Let's get out and witness. Let's get out and preach the gospel. Let's get out and bring fruit into the kingdom. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. That you should go forth, not that you should lie down. That you should go forth, not that you should fold your hand. That you should go forth, not that you will close your mouth. That you should go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit will remain. So we are learning that as this time of harvest is on, let us reach out and our best souls into the kingdom of God. And when we do, there is reward at the end of the harvest. Now let's go back to Proverbs chapter 6 and look at the iniquity of fools. Here God speaks about the things that he hates. The things that must not be in our lives if we want the love of God to reign supreme in our hearts. If we want to keep fellowship with the Lord, relationship with the Lord, he says, these are the things I hate, avoid them. These things are abominable in my sight. Run away from them. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. Number one, a proud look. Do you know that God hates pride? Wherever pride is found, he hates it. God does not want pride in any of his children because it's a sin. It's an iniquity. It's a great trespass. It's a great abomination. Now listen to me. Whenever you see a lady wearing slacks, oh, you say that's abomination? Do you know that when you are proud, it's the same abomination in the sight of the Lord? Haven't you seen it in that passage, verse 16? These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. I want you to see Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. When people are proud, it may be they are proud in attitude. It may be they are proud in the way they relate and interact with other people. It may be they are proud because of the way they speak to other people. They look down. They belittle other people. They think about what I have got, what I know, how I dress. I'm better than everybody else. Who is so and so to talk to me like that? Proud, arrogant, haughty. And because of that pride, they are far away from God. Whatever Christian experience you had before, the moment pride comes into your heart, you become an abomination before the Lord. And destruction is very near. Because before destruction ever comes, pride will be the forerunner. 
Pride will be the herald that will bring destruction and fall upon your life. In fact, we are told in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. That means if you are proud, God will deny you fellowship. You'll be hard in heart. You'll be dry in the heart. All the spiritual qualities you had before, you'll find that they're no more there. You'll just be a shell without the treasure within it. Just an empty clay without the precious ointment inside it. Just an empty cloud without any water that will come in because God resisted the proud. He draws away from the proud. He will not show his presence and his power to the proud. In fact, it hinders prayer. Because your relationship with God is affected. That's why if you have that abominable sin, abominable iniquity in your life, pride, you must get rid of it. Come back to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17. A lying tongue. God also hates lying. Do you know there are people that lie in different, different ways? Wives lying to their husbands. Covering up and being unfaithful. Husbands lying to their wives concerning money. Concerning the things on the family. Concerning the in-laws. They lie. Blatant lies. Obvious lies. Lies that will deceive your wife. And that's an abomination before the Lord. Do you know there are traders that lie? And they will say, for so much I bought that thing. And it's a lie. So that they can get so much gain. Do you know there are people that buy and then they issue false receipts and they lie? Do you know there are people that go to a place of work, they are supposed to resume at a particular time. They come one and a half hours later. They lie and they say they came earlier. Do you know there are people that want to get married and they go and swear at Bidawit and they lie? Do you know there are people that will even lie to children of God, to brothers and sisters in the church? It's a great abomination before the Lord. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. The people that are selling, and they will say, you know, for so much I bought it, and they are telling lies. The salesman that will tell lie, that thing is not good enough, that thing is not a genuine spare part, you know it is fake, and yet you give it out as if it were genuine. God hates it. In Revelation, Chapter 21 and verse 8. But the fearful, unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, all mongers, sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, the people that say they are telling white lies to get out of punishment, all liars. What does it say? It says that they shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The third thing that God says he hates, come back to Proverbs chapter 6. And in verse 17, hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. Let me ask you, who would you think is innocent more? A child, two weeks old, or a man, 40 years old? You know, the, the, younger, the younger one is innocent. That little child, that little infant of two weeks knows nothing, has done nothing wrong. The child does not even know the difference between right and wrong. Just completely innocent at the age of two weeks. And then the person that is 40 years of age, well, that may not be too innocent. But we know that the younger one is innocent. But let me ask you, how about the baby that is not born yet? If the one for two weeks is innocent, how about the one still in, inside the mother? Oh, that one is completely innocent. Tell me, what wrong has that child done to the doctor? That that doctor is taking the life of that child that is not born yet. That's an innocent child. What wrong, what evil has that child inside the mother committed? That uh, the nurse is doing, is committing that abortion. What wrong has the person, has that child done that the pharmacist is recommending the pills that will kill and destroy that innocent baby? That's an abomination before the Lord. 
you know, just that woman will just say, I don't want the child, just with a single sentence, I don't want the child, then they take the life of that child. And the Bible says, God hates the people whose hands will shed innocent blood. Now the word of God is against murder. And he doesn't want you to kill. He doesn't want you to kill the innocent babies that are yet, yet unborn, or the innocent babies that are already born, or the men and the women all around you. Let each one live his life and you live your life. Why are we going to why are you going to kill somebody? Because of a parcel of plan, you take the whole of the life. You render the you render the wife a widow. You render the children fatherless. Because of a plot of land, how can people be so wicked and take the life of a man because of a plot of land? Because of little disagreement, because of little disagreement on little, little things, on a vehicle, on a bicycle, on just interaction, on a drinking table, on marriage or no marriage, on whether you give me this or I don't give you that, and then they take the life of somebody. Is that blood equal to the parcel of land? Is that blood equal to that thing you are arguing about? God hates murder. Look at Romans chapter 1. From verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. You see there, murder. What's the judgment? Verse 32. Who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death? The moment you begin to touch the life of another person and you begin to plan shedding blood, one, you have spiritual death. You lose relationship with God. You are separated from the Lord Almighty. Number two, you will soon die. Now tell me, somebody that is shedding blood, will he live all his life to the full? No, he'll die. He'll die. Because, you see, when you are shedding man's blood, you cut the lives of other people short. What will happen to that person is that he too will suffer physical death. That thing you are gathering together and massing together by taking the lives of other people. You are not going to live to enjoy it except to repent. And then at last there is eternal death in the lake of fire. Final, total, complete, eternal separation from the Lord Almighty. It doesn't stop there. It says, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Nurse, did you hear that? You say, well, I don't commit the abortion. It's the doctor that does it. I am just an attendant. I'm just the person that brings all the things they are using. I am not actually committing the abortion, but you know, this is my work, and I have no say in this, and the doctor wants to do it, and the doctor calls me, it says, you have pleasure in them that do them. You suffer the same punishment. You want to keep that job of committing abortion? You want to keep that job of shedding blood? And then get the judgment of God upon your life? Avoid, escape from the judgment that is to come. And then it talks about evil imaginations and plans. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 6. Reading from verse 12. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a proud mouth. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his speech. He teacheth with his fingers. That is, he's always planning. He uses all his faculties, his fingers, his eyes, his feet, everything that he has to plan evil. Prowardness is in his heart. And he devises mischief continually. He sweats discord. Therefore, shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. In verse 18, and heart that devises wicked imaginations. Look at Micah chapter 2. From verse 1. Woe to them that devise iniquity and walk evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it, because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and take them by violence, and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. In the night, they work it out, they think about it, they plan it, they gather together, they make a conspiracy, and then during the day, they go ahead and they do evil. The Bible says that 
The sinner shall not go unpunished. Those people that do evil, they plan it in the night time, practice it in the day, the judgment of God is sure to come upon them. And around, he also says about the people that have the wickedness and the terrible imaginations. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 18. And heart that devises wicked imaginations, and then feet that be swift in running to mischief. The judgment of God is very sure, very definite upon such evil doers. Then he talks about false witnesses. In verse 19, a false witness that speaketh lies. A false witness that speaketh lies. Doesn't it happen in the zone, in the area, in the district, in the church? There's a controversy, a difference between two people. And then you need a witness. And then a witness will come. But a false witness. And then either he will speak half truth and not tell everything he knows about it. And then the people that are looking into that controversy will take a wrong decision because they're only basing all their decisions on half truth. The Bible says there is judgment upon such people. Deuteronomy chapter 19 from verse 16. If a false witness rise up, against any man to testify against him that which is wrong. Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, diligent search, diligent interrogation. You hear that? That you just don't hear only one person. And then, when you see the person they have reported, you've not even heard what the person will say. You say, uh-huh, I know you're an evildoer. Why did you say that, brother? You've not even listened to me. Oh, yes, I know. The person who told me cannot be wrong. How do you know? Does our zonal law judge any man before it hear him? You'll make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shall thou put the evil away from among you. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 19. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. He that soweth discord among the brethren. The tail bearers in the zone, knocking heads together, dividing the church of God. And they're always going about men and women, busy bodies and tattlers and, and um, tail bearers. Did you hear what brother so-and-so said about you? Did they send you? Did you hear what sister so-and-so said in our area meeting about you? Did they send you? Did you hear what they said in the church about you? Did they send you to carry tales, to carry stories? Don't you know you are dividing the church? Don't you know you are dividing that zone? Don't you know that as you are going about, you go to the husband and you say, hey, do you know what your wife is doing when you are not around? Are you the gate man of their family? Then you go to the wife and you say, hey, sit down there, sit down there. You know what is happening to your husband? You know the people that are befriending your husband in the office? Are you the watchman over that husband, over the family? You are breaking the family. And then you call uh, the parents and you say, Now this child, do you know that this child has evil spirit? Is that the ministry God has given you? You know there was a child that we picked up on the road. I mean this child is an adult. And he was even going to secondary school. Somebody just called the parents, the father and said, That child has familiar spirit. The father said, What? My child? And drove that child out. And that child was on the street. And somebody just saw that child on the street and we had to bring the child in. We sent her back to school. Now the child has finished secondary school. The child has even finished higher education because it happened some years ago. But you see, the person that told the father that is breaking that family. And there are people that are breaking the church of God. They're destroying and dividing the church of God. They go about telling stories. Somebody did something wrong some time ago and everybody has forgotten about it but they dig it up again. They dig it up again. Did you hear? Ah, uh, you don't know. You don't have proper information. So and so did something and the pastor did not take it easy with him. They disciplined him. That's your ministry. 
to divide the church of God. To destroy the people that have prayed and God has forgiven them. And then to bring back the old ones into their minds again. Is that a good ministry? That's an abomination before the Lord. The people that go about to sow discord among the people of God. You know why the Corinthians, why they died prematurely? Because they did not discern the Lord's body. And there was division and disunity in the body of Christ. And those people that were causing it, and they will go and take the Lord's supper, they were dying prematurely. Be very careful, watch your tongue. Do not divide the people of God. Now let's come back to Proverbs chapter 6. From verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, and from the flat tree of the tongue of a strange woman, lost not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Here what the word of God is saying is that adultery is a terrible sin. It's a great sin in the sight of the Lord. Fornication is a great terrible sin in the sight of the Lord. And by that adultery, by that fornication, you become ordinary, worthless piece of bread. No life. Eternal life is gone. You want to tell me that a person that is committing adultery... A person committing fornication, he still has eternal life. No, not at all. That's a great sin before the Lord. An immoral sin. An iniquity before the Lord. And if you are living in adultery, if you are living in fornication, and you are hiding it, God knows your life. God knows your heart. God sees everything you do behind a closed door. Everything you do in the darkness. God knows everything. You become a worthless, lifeless piece of bread. Eternal life is gone. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? What does that mean? When you go into adultery or fornication, the garment of righteousness is taken away from you. Now you are naked. Now you are in the kingdom of darkness. Now you don't have the grace of God covering you. Now you don't have the a favor of God covering you because all your clothes have been burnt. Your clothes of righteousness. Everything has been taken away. Verse 28. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? Now the judgment of God is upon such a person. Then it says in verse 29. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. You may be smiling. That doesn't mean you are innocent. You may be laughing. That doesn't mean you are innocent. You may be going about and being active in church work and running here and running there, and yet you are living in adultery and fornication. You are not innocent. In fact, you are a total backslider. In fact, you are worse than a sinner that had never been born again because you had the grace of God, you have squandered it. You had the grace of God, you have thrown it away. Jesus was in your life, you have pushed him away. You have replaced Jesus Christ, the Lord, and the Prince of Life with the adulteress, with the adulterer. You love you appreciate, you worship, you serve that adulterer, that adulteress more than you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, I will forget Calvary. I will forget Christ. I will forget the cross. I will rather embrace this woman rather than embrace the word of God. Rather than embrace the kingdom of God. Rather than embrace Jesus Christ, the Lord and the master. You say you prefer an adulterer more than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't repent, you'll go to hell. Because now that adulterer is the one that is holding your heart, holding your emotion, holding your mind, holding your body, spending your money, and you do everything. What you would have done, the time, the attention, the affection, the love, you should have given to Christ, you have given it out to that adulterer. You are lost. You are not in the kingdom again. Except you come back and say, Lord, a wretched, miserable sinner that I am, save my soul. Except you do that, eternal lake of fire is waiting. Look at verse 32. But whoso committed adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get. His reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom. Neither will he set the will he rest content, though he giveth many gifts. You may give many gifts to the people that knew about it to close their mouth, to silence them, and say, don't let them hear this. Heaven has heard already. Don't let them hear this. God knows it already. Don't let them hear this. The angels know it already. Don't let them hear it. Millions and millions of angels and departed saints, they know it already. What are you hiding? 
all your sins are naked before the Lord. What will you do then? Only to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I know you have discovered me. I know you have found me out. I know you have seen the things that are wrong in my life. The pride, the lying, the murder, the abortion, the wickedness, the evil plans and the mischief and the false witness and the sowing of discord you've been doing and all the adultery and the fornication. Why are you going to wait until the judgment day? Escape for your life. Do not stay in any of the plain, but escape to the mountain of holiness because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Escape for your life. Do not think we're children of Abraham. The axe is laid at the root of every tree. The tree that bringeth forth not fruit, he'll hew down and cast into the fire. But the Lord is waiting because there is mercy and forgiveness with him. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Rise up and talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Don't let me die in sin. Call upon the name of the Lord. Don't hide. Don't deceive yourself. But it's mercy for those who repent. Mercy for those who call upon the Lord. 